Welcome back for part two of the diagram analysis. You'll see we're starting off with something different than ecology. Our first picture is going to be that of the cell. Note I have the terms organelle, structure, and then function. Remember for function it could also be called a process. Looking over here at number one, it's actually pointing to these little dots. Those little dots we talked about when we were just doing protein synthesis in the other one. Number one represents the ribosome. The ribosome is the organelle or structure. Organelles are like tiny little organs inside of the cell. And the function or the process that happens here is going to be protein synthesis. Remember the little hint to remember what the function is, is going to be that ribs are made up of proteins. Synthesis just means to build or to make. For our next one, I didn't really go over this with my class a ton, but two represents a vacuole. And the function of a vacuole is for storage. Could be storage of food, could be storage of water. Usually it just looks like an empty circle or oval in the picture. The next one on the list is going to be three. Note there is more than one three. And you'll see there's more than one two, more than one one. So there are many of the same organelle within a cell with a few exceptions. Number three kind of has that squiggly little line in it that I've talked about a few times. That squiggly little line I always think about looks like an M. So therefore that's going to be a mitochondria. I do find most people remember that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, but let's think of the specific process. The specific process is cellular respiration. And keep in mind, cellular respiration is responsible for making that usable energy known as ATP. And then our last organelle is the structure that goes all the way around and that is going to be my cell or my plasma membrane. And this is involved in the process of transport. Think about passive transport, active transport. It's how things can get into and out of the cell. Also keep in mind that it is selectively permeable. That means that Things can get in and out based on their size. Small molecules like glucose and water, carbon dioxide and oxygen can easily pass through the little membrane, while as larger molecules such as starch and proteins and fats, they can't fit through. There is one other organelle, even though it's not highlighted. I think it's just good to review. That guy there, that's gonna be my nucleus. The nucleus is in charge of regulation. That's one of those life processes. And also keep in mind, this is going to be where my DNA is. So it's more or less like the brain of the cell. Now, one thing that I find my students struggle with quite a bit is going to be this levels of organization. The levels of organization, frequently on the regions, they have you organize them from smallest to biggest, we're from biggest to smallest. We're going based on living things. So the smallest living thing is going to be made up of just one cell. On this side, I would note that this is small and then the organism is going to be large. Sometimes instead of using general terms, they use more specific terms. Maybe it'll say plant cell and then the organism would be an oak tree and an organ would be a leaf. Looking here, we have cells X, which is what we have to identify, organs, organ systems, organism. X in this case is going to be tissue. I often find that that is the forgotten organizational level. You put a bunch of cells together and then you can get things like muscle tissue, right? Epithelial tissue. Um, so tissues are building blocks of organs. You put a bunch of tissues together and then you get a fully functional organ. One thing that they'll sometimes put on here, which is not living independently, 
but also considered a level of organization, would be an organelle. Remember, organelles are tiny organ-like structures inside of these cells that we just looked at in the picture above. Looking at some human body questions. Over here, we have hormones. Things we want to remember about hormones are that hormones are proteins. Therefore, they have a specific shape. Note, hormones get released into your bloodstream and then they only affect certain cells. Right here, I have a target cell. It can affect a target cell, but over here, these non-target cells, it just doesn't work on. The reason for that is going to be because target cells have receptors on them that have a complementary shape to the hormone that was released. So they fit together like a lock and key. So you have target cells have specifically shaped receptors. Receptors are just another type of protein that match the hormone shape. And by match, I mean they're complementary, they fit together like a lock and key. Also hormones, again, those are proteins, receptors are proteins. Anything that's a protein has that specific shape. Our next one wants you to define the word mutation. And that's because looking here, I have C-A-C, T-A-G, C-G-A. C-A-C, T-A-A. Hmm. So looking here, I have a change. It's just one letter change, but it still counts as a mutation. A mutation is a change in the genetic base sequence. Remember, we have four different bases. A, T, C, and G. Sometimes when you ch change it, it's going to just be a silent mutation, which doesn't change the amino acid because we group them in threes. But every so often, you wind up getting a new amino acid. And if you get a new amino acid, that protein is going to twist into a different shape. So it says, explain how a mutation can negatively impact protein synthesis. It could code for a different amino acid. Think back to that codon chart. I'm going to abbreviate amino acid AA, which changes the protein shape. Over here, um, it says explain how guard cells, here are my guard cells, on the underside of a leaf help to maintain homeostasis. That word homeostasis is talking about balance inside of the leaf. Just like we sweat or we release insulin to keep our blood sugar low, plants also need a mechanism to maintain that balance. Sometimes this is going to be called a feedback mechanism. Those two words can be used interchangeably. And the reason why this is an example, if I look here, these guard cells are swollen, therefore they're open. What that's going to allow to happen? Oxygen, carbon dioxide, right, those can move in either direction. Same thing with water vapor, it can go in and out. But then if it's a really dry condition, like here, one thing you'll notice is that it closes up, and that is going to allow for that water to stay inside of the leaf so it doesn't lose too much water. So this allows for gas exchange. If there's too much or too little carbon dioxide and water and oxygen, it's going to open and close to allow for those things to pass through. And note here, right on the underside, you'll see that there are some chloroplasts. The chloroplasts are going to be important because they're going to allow for photosynthesis to take place, so therefore they produce food for these cells. And then as they produce food for those cells, 
the cells can use the food to make ATP through cellular respiration. Because remember, all the things happen inside of plants and producers. Over here we have the term biotic. Biotic means living. You could pick the fish, plant, microorganism, snail. Abiotic means non-living. Water, soil. You also could say, hey, there's a bunch of other things you can't see, like dissolved oxygen, dissolved carbon dioxide. That would work as well. Identify how at least two biotic factors in this model interact within their ecosystem. This you can think about a material cycle, either through nitrogen, or you can think about a, um, a carbon dioxide oxygen one. Let's say like this guy, the plant, gives off O2. Then the fish uses the O2. Then the fish gives off carbon dioxide. And then the plant uses the carbon dioxide. You could also think about the fact that the fish and the snail both produce feces, and then these microorganisms ingest the feces and recycle the material by, back in. So again, I would use one of the material cycles either for nitrogen or more like a carbon and oxygen cycle. The process to the left represents how egg cells are produced. Remember, egg cells are an example of a gamete or a sex cell. Just like I've said in the past, make sure that you kind of group those words together in your mind so that it's going to be a lot easier when you see them on the test to just switch them automatically. Here we have female egg cells. Where are they produced? Think about the female reproductive system. We'll see a picture later. Female reproductive system, eggs are going to be in the ovaries. You have two ovaries. The process, process is going to be a type of cell division. That's called meiosis. When I think of meiosis, I think about sex cells. Because that E, I know it's easy to get mitosis and meiosis confused. So use that little E as your hint. And how do egg cells differ from body cells in terms of chromosome number? Note here, this says diploid. Diploid means two. Those are going to have two N in terms of their chromosome number. If you're looking at an egg cell, an egg cell just has N. That's going to be called haploid. Haploid has half the normal number. So egg cells are haploid. For humans, that's going to be 23 chromosomes. Body cells are diploid. Diploid has 46 chromosomes. And a lot of times I do see it represented as an N or a 2N. They do give you this other information. These guys will all die. For females, when one of these diploid germ cells divides, only one egg is going to be a functional egg that can be fertilized by sperm. Over here we have an enzyme question. Enzymes are just another example of a protein. Also remember another name for an enzyme is going to be a catalyst or organic catalyst. The word organic just refers to the fact that it has both carbon and hydrogen in it. When you take chemistry, you'll see there are other types of catalysts. Not all of them are going to be organic. Identify one other environmental factor that can negatively affect enzyme activity. Here I have temperature. The other one is going to be pH. If you don't remember, pH refers to if something is an acid or a base. Acid values are 1 to 6. Base is going to be 8 to 14. And then you have neutral, which is right around 7. Explain why the rate of reaction of the enzyme drastically decreases past the optimum. Well, it does say in the first one, which I never did, to identify the optimum. Optimum is going to be my high point. I draw a line straight down to the best of my ability. 
that's going to be 37 degrees Celsius, which makes sense because if you don't know, 37 degrees Celsius is normal body temperature, which is 98.6 approximately. Why all of a sudden, once you get in this section, is the slope so steep for that graph? That's going to be because once you get past here, that enzyme starts to denature or change shape. And once it changes shape, it's not going to be able to work very well, if at all. And you'll see here, you know, once you start getting above 100 degrees for your temperature, those enzymes do not work as well. So a very high fever is concerning because your enzymes will denature, and then that will wind up causing you to die. So you want to make sure that you're taking medication that's going to lower that temperature. So enzymes denature. which just means change shape. At extreme temperatures and by extreme, we're really just meaning once you get past that optimum. Also at extreme pHs. Explain why an enzyme can only work on one specific substrate. Like amylase can only work on starch and not glucose. So let's say here, my lovely drawing, we have amylase. And then here, I have starch. What you'll notice is they have complementary shapes. Again, not the best artist, so they may not fit together perfectly in my drawing, but in real life they would fit together because they have those specific shapes. If I was looking at starch, Sorry, if I was looking at glucose, let's make it look a little crazy. This guy here, my glucose that I drew, does not have the complementary shape for the am amylase. They can't fit together like a puzzle piece, right? They need a really snug fit. So this all has to do with specific shape. If the specific shape matches like a puzzle, it works. If it doesn't, then it can't. But each amylase or each enzyme has a really specific shape that only works with one thing. Moving on to some human impact, here again we have one of those pattern questions. It's asking for a general trend as to what's happening. When I look at these, I try to look at where I notice the biggest change. So from 1800 to 2000, there has been a drastic increase. And I always tell my students, try to be as specific with the data as you can be. So in 1800, right, that line is right there. And then in, if we're looking 2000-ish, it's all the way up here. So it's increased by over 100 parts per million. So from... 1800 to about 2000 carbon dioxide levels have increased by over a hundred parts per million like 125 parts per million Explain one reason CO2 levels have changed so drastically in the last 100 years. So if I look even further, kind of like right in the middle here, you'll see there's an even more dramatic spike. And the reason for that is really going to be industrialization. Industrialization is referring to the fact that now we have things like factories, mass production, sorry, spelling that wrong, uh, mass production of goods. We have cars, we have planes. Just in general, anytime they're asking, like, what's the number one problem? Human population. Right around 8 billion, and it just keeps going up. The other thing, burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels to drive cars, fossil fuels to make electricity, fossil fuels to do all the things, right? So... We need to try to reduce that. Explain why increasing levels of CO2 are concerning. Carbon dioxide acts like a blanket.
So it traps heat. And they call that a lot of times global warming, but really not even just global warming, climate change in general. Because while the temperature might be changing, you might also notice wherever you live, maybe there's a drought, maybe there's more forest fires, maybe there's more rain, the hurricanes are more intense. There's a lot of things going on, not just, wow, it's getting hotter. But it actually is getting hotter because there's more days above 90 degrees, more consecutive days above 90 degrees. Um, there's increasing sea levels, hurricanes crazy, things like that. I didn't realize how many ribosome things I put on here, but here we have amino acids. When amino acids got bonded together, they make a protein. We've already gone over that a few times, so I'm just going to kind of hurry along. Explain why the nerve cell and the skin cell have the same DNA, but prefer perform different jobs. So I'm looking here, the nerve cell has those green areas, and then my skin cells are going to have those areas. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but what we have to realize is that different areas are turned on or activated. I mean, this one has three, this one has four. This process is called differentiation. It's when different genes are turned on in different cells. Kind of like a light switch. So all the cells in your body have the same exact DNA your nerve cell and your skin cell, but they look real different. Like looking at these pictures, they don't look the same. Why don't they look the same? And that all has to do with the fact that even though they have all the same instruction manuals, they're reading different pages of the instruction manual so that they can do the job they need to do, right? So here, they read the directions for this part, this part, and this part. That's it in the nerve cell. This guy over here, the skin cell, is reading these four directions. You'll note there could potentially be some overlap, but there's not a ton of overlap. And because of that, they do different things. Back to ecology. If you haven't noticed, so many ecology diagrams. Real important that you know. Here we have decomposers. These bacteria are decomposers. One thing you should note about the decomposers, we've got some excretion, some dead animals. Excretion is referring to like feces and things like that that are being taken out of the body. Um, explain why the role of decompose, explain the role of decomposers. Decomposers break down and recycle dead organic material. Which in turn creates nitrogen rich soil. which allows for plants to grow. Right? It's nature making fertilizer. You don't have to buy it. It's like for people who do composting, which is pretty much saving vegetable peels, maybe eggshells, coffee grinds, different types of paper products. You put it into a composter, you churn it, and then you get good soil. You put that down so that you can give it to your plants. The plants love the nitrogen, it allows them to grow, and then you don't have to put down pesky fertilizer on your lawn. Over here we have female reproductive system. You'll note we're talking about structures. You'll note I don't have structure one because I've honestly never seen it on the test. If I look here at number two, I've also never seen two, so I probably we're just going to cross that one off as well. So we're just going to look at three, four, and five. Here I have three. Notice there's a redundancy, meaning that there's two. That's important because if there's damage to one, you can still do the fertilization and make the baby. If I look here, I've got three. Three is pointing to the ovary. Ovary does two things. One, makes eggs. Remember we just said the eggs are going to be through meiosis. 
The second thing it does, it makes the hormones. Not all of the hormones, but it's going to make estrogen and progesterone. Both of those are going to be important for thickening the uterine lining so that the fetus or embryo at that point can bury itself into the uterus and then develop. If I'm looking here at number four, again, two of those. That's going to be my fallopian tube. Fallopian tube with the F, that's going to be where fertilization takes place. Fertilization is when sperm and egg meet. And that creates a zygote, which is on the bottom of this page. So we'll go over all that good stuff there. And then our last one is five. Bring to this whole area. Five is the uterus. If you ever look at a side view, it looks like a U, an upside down U. This is going to be fetal development. A lot of people want to be like, that's where the baby grows. Just note the regions is going to say fetal development. Over here, I have two different molecules. Note both of them or, are organic molecules. Organic molecules have carbon, hydrogen. Carbon, hydrogen. Which molecule has the potential to provide the most energy for an individual? That's going to be a fat molecule. Usually energy is going to be determined by the amount of carbon. You'll see it. There's a ton of carbon here. One thing I was trying to express to my students is um, sometimes to get energy, you have to use a little bit of energy. So there's a bunch of rearranging of the chemical bonds, which is going to allow for energy, in this case, to be released when you digest things. So we're looking at carbon and number of bonds. And while sugar has carbon in bonds, not nearly as much as a fat molecule. The models to the left represent two sugar molecules, explain why glucose can pass through the membrane, by, while sucrose can't. Note, this is one ring, this is two rings. It all has to do with size. Glucose is small. Small things can fit through. Sucrose comparatively, is big. Not as big as starch, because you'd have many sugar molecules attached together if it was starch. And again, these are both organic because they have a carbon and a hydrogen located in them. No, they don't have to be touching in order to count. Over here, we have embryonic development. I would write that on the top because apparently I don't have that anywhere. Process one, process one, sperm and egg come together. That's fertilization. If they asked how did the sperm and egg get made, like before, right, that would be meiosis occurs first. Sperm and egg meet. Where do they meet? That's going to be my fallopian tube. Again, refer back up to the top if you need to. Number two is called a zygote. Note, these guys here have half the normal number of chromosomes because they're a sex cell. So they both have the N number. And then once you get to my zygote, they have two N. All of these cells, this is all mitosis. A word we haven't gone over yet. Mitosis I always say it makes my two cells. So one cell makes two. Two cells makes four. Four cells, and they're kind of speeding up, makes eight, eight, 16, and so on. The other thing I remember is that mitosis makes two identical cells. So that's my mitosis. And then from seven and eight, when it goes from just a ball of cells to a bird, that's going to be a differentiation we were talking on the last page about. Differentiation is when cells get their jobs. Cells become specialized.
And then the last type of question they ask regarding this, explain how the number and types of chromosomes in structure two compare to the numbers and types in structure four. Or we could say seven, or we could say eight. They are all identical. That comes down to the fact that this is all mitosis, and if they're all doing mitosis, they're all going to be identical cells. All cells have identical chromosomes after that zygote, right? So from two all the way on, all of those cells have identical chromosomes. Same number, same types. So this one here has 46. Each one of these guys here also have 46. All right, here we got the base pairing rules. Remember A and T go together, C and G. All teachers go crazy. Or some people say apples and trees, cars in the garage, whatever one works for you. If A, if there are 20 A, there are going to be 20 T. How do I know that? They always match up. They're pairs. They're buddies. Whenever you see an A, you see a T. Now, those together equal 40%. We got to get up to 100. That's our goal. We got to figure out G and C. I have 40. 40 is already accounted for. To get rid of that 40, I got 60. Do not write 60 down for C and G. What you need to do is this is accounting for both of them. You got to divide.